Okay, got it. Everybody get it? Or is it just me? Okay. Um, we're, we're obviously are having all sorts of difficulties, uh, some technical ones and some illness ones as well. So what I was, uh, what I was saying was that uh, um, normally, I, I think I, I would give uh, somewhat longer introductions, but given the fact that with all of these technical and, and uh, illness things, uh, we, uh, we really have, we're starting a little late, so we have a little less time than I had wanted. Um, these uh, webinars are sort of scheduled to be about an hour and a half long. We have sometimes gone on a little bit beyond that, but we will try to stick to this. Um, following um, Clara's practice of going from east to west, and it has to do with time zones, uh, of people in, in, what is Paul? What time is it? 11? Yeah, it's very late. So, so that's partly why we always do this. Uh, I will I will follow that uh, practice as well. But you know, if if you feel that you need to actually say something uh, about yourself during the initial five minutes, it's fine. A reminder, oh, several reminders. One is uh, please to the speakers. Please remember that you have two rounds. So in the first round, a maximum of five minutes. Uh, and then we will, I will uh, keep, I will keep track and then we will open for a second round, maximum five minutes. If it's less, that's even better. So we can have ample time for questions, answers, discussions, debate, and so forth. A uh, uh, second thing is it, it would be really helpful if the questions and comments actually came um, through chat rather than, than other things, and that's very helpful. Um, I guess, uh, uh, let me sort of go ahead again from right to left. So we will do Paul, uh, let's see, uh, Nikiwa, am I mispronouncing any names? Rui, Rui, um, and Andrea and Alex, in that order, okay? So um, just, let me just do very quick introductions now and we can proceed. Uh, Paul, Paul Hansen is at Hokkaido University in Japan. He is uh, primarily conducting uh, field work in Japan, but has also done research in Jamaica and Canada. He has one book under review on the industrialization of Hokkaido dairy farms and another contracted on the well-being, uh, One Health and Rural Japan. Uh, Anu, uh, what's your last name? Jalai? Jalai? Anu? Am I mispronouncing your name? Are you here? She's not here. Okay. If she's not here, then, then we will proceed. Okay. Now people are joining in. In any case, I hope Anu will join us. Uh, National University of Singapore, uh, an environmental anthropologist working. Um, at the uh, uh, National University of Singapore South Asian Studies and Comparative Asian Studies Departments. Um, we still hope she will join us. Um, okay, so I have a long train, but I'm going to do shorter introductions. Uh, next is Nikki Wes Solomon of UCT, University of Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, she uh, tends to work at the interface of science, technology, politics, and urban river and water management. Uh, and uh, clearly she is also a research associate at the African Center for the Economy, where she practices the integration of theoretical knowledge and the experience of every day, of the everyday, engaging with community-based organizations and civil society. Uh, Rui, is that, is that? Um, Yes. Yeah, thank you of the University of Lisbon in Portugal, who probably knows uh, Clara well, uh, is an invited assistant professor, um, has worked on human evolution at the University of Coimbra, has a master's degree in human, ev uh, well, human evolution and biology, also from the University of Coimbra and a PhD in anthropology, specializing in biological anthropology and ethnoecology at the Universidade Nova de Lisboa, the new University of, of uh, Lisbon and Cardiff University. Uh, she can explain lots of research interests having to do with political ecology and anthropology natural research. Uh, next will be Andrea, 
Zuri. Is that even close? Zuri. Yeah. Zuri. Okay, sorry. Uh, I speak Portuguese more than Portuguese, but uh, Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais in Brazil. Uh, she is in the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology at the uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil, where she uh, founded the Group on Environmental Studies and coordinated the team that created the undergraduate course in Social Environmental Sciences. You can see that a lot of this is very important work. She has published articles and books about mining, ah, large dams, environmental conflicts. Sobre a minha área, não sei como é que eu estou convidado. Sorry, no wait. Tem uma única publicação I na, I should have said, área. please mute everybody, everybody except for the speaker. Always mute. I heard Portuguese, so I don't know whether that was Andrea or. Uh, uh, did I say for senior? Uh, Rui. Uh, anyway, last but not least, Alex, Alex Oler. Again, am I mispronouncing? Is that correct? Yes. From the uh, University of Virginia in Canada, Canada. Um, he is a circumpolar ethnographer with special interests in human animal and human landscape relations, uh, has worked a lot on how societal ideas in a religious, philosophical, and, and, and practical context converge with the ways in which people relate to animals within and outside of their own lives. Anyway, I could, I could obviously go on much more, but uh, uh, let's, uh, let's not take much longer to start because again, we relate and we're really all quite delighted that you, uh, you are here. So uh, some people will join us, but a reminder, if you're not speaking, I will try to model this. If you're not speaking, just mute. So I'm going to unmute very soon so that uh, Paul can speak and you know, five minutes max in the opening round. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Paul, you need to unmute now. Okay, great. Um, well, I wanted to start by thanking Clara for inviting me, but uh, I just hope she's well. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Virginia, for moderating. But I have to say, when I was first asked to join this group, I was a bit puzzled. Um, without getting into Latour's politics of nature, it's some provocation being what this worldly thing can be called unnatural. At first glance, my research, my research seems to be a perfect counterpoint to any notion of, quote, anthropology in the natural world. I am an anthropologist, that's true enough, but I've focused on industrial dairy farming in Hokkaido, and companion canines in Osaka, relations with two of the most human altered species in utterly human altered locations. So I began to wonder if the invitation to this talk was kind of a setup. Um, at, an, at a AAA, I was once the very uncomfortable outlier in a round table of critical animal studies scholars uh, in saying that A, industrial farmers are really not all that bad, and B, activist anthropology is basically for activists. You're going to do very little to make an impact on farmers, fishers, foresters, dog breeders, all the people that you rail against, nor are you likely going to sway the general public talking amongst yourself in esoteric language. So alarm bells were ringing when I was invited. However, then I thought about this more. Um, Hokkaido, where I live, work, and research is Japan, Japan's lasting contribution to the colonial settler state model. The island was once called Ezodashima, or Wild or Barbarian Island, and it was renamed Hokkaido, or North Sea Route, in 1869 and officially claimed by Japan. But from the 1600s, culminating, culminating in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, its indigenous inhabitants, human and non-human, were subdued, for example, the Ainu people, or eradicated, like the Ezo wolf, to make way for extractive industries, and agricultural sediments of Japanese migrants who were often marginalized people themselves. And I think this is a common global and more than human story, though one sel seldom focused on in the context of Japan. Today for industrial farms to exist, uh, the unseated waterways and lands of indigenous people are used, bought, sold, paved over, fenced, and wildlife must be kept at bay through, for example, another research area I've focused on, municipal or privately paid hunters. Um, they hunt a variety of species that are considered harmful to industrial farming, but perhaps and the most notably in Hokkaido are deer who ravage crops and some farmers worry have the potential to spread viruses to domesticated, or we could say denatured uh, animals. 
Um, this is often trained in Hokkaido as the Shikanomondai or the deer problem, but not to pick on Hokkaido in more southern regions of Japan, you have the monkey problem or the wild boar problem, it's the same problem. Um, via a host of unforeseen happenstances, I wound up doing research on companion dogs in Osaka, but my original proposal for that research, and it's a long story, was actually urban pests and not urban pets. Um, and I still maintain for some young anthropologists out there, this would be a great topic to pick up on. Foxes, crows, cockroaches, raccoons, and even bear are increasingly common in the suburbs. And they blur this, this boundary between, quote, domestic and, um, and, and natural. Um, one key reason for the encroachment of these species is human depopulation. In other words, Japan uh, dehumanizing. Uh, and a reversion of domesticated land, whether farmland, Sakoyama, or villages on the outskirts of human population centers that revert, or we could say, go back to nature. And finally, beyond these this worldly connections, urban Japan has historically had a special place for nature, culture, boundary crossing animals. Um, spiritual beings such as Inari, which are divine foxes that carry messages, or Tanuki, which are ra raccoons anthropomorphized as well endowed drunken rabble rousers. So I feel that this topic today is, is an important crossroads of post-human and cosmopolitical concerns of ethics and ecology and focusing on my own sort of contemporary research right now, ikigai or meaning of life and one health. And I hope I can contribute something to this discussion, though I'm not sure what yet. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I, I'm sure you can contribute quite a bit. Uh, is Anu here? No? Well. If she, if she actually, can somebody send her uh, email uh, in, in, I can put her in at any point. She is uh, supposedly in Singapore and it is late at night, but let, let us uh, proceed with Nikki Wewen, uh, Nikki with Solomon, whom I introduced before, who appears way on the left on my screen. Anyway, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Um, thank you um, for the invitation to be a part of this discussion. Um, and I'm wishing Clara a speedy recovery, speedy recovery. So I was asked to join this talk and had no idea what I would talk about because it was quite open-ended, the natural world. What does that mean? Um, and as an anthropologist and working at the intersection between um, infrastructure, human, the human world and the natural world, like where do you even start? What do you even, uh, what conversations can you even have? Um, but because I recently finished my PhD, um, looking at urban river management and focusing on a particular river in Cape Town, um, I thought I would perhaps start off on that part, um, looking at the kind of research questions that were emerging, the kind of topics and kind of issues that were emerging from that. Um, and also thinking deeply about the next phase of my research, which aims to look at critical zones inquiries, looking at the critical zone, what is a critical zone and what the earth sciences are looking at in terms of critical zone studies and how we bring the anthropological or ethnographic aspect into understanding the human nature um, relationships. So I'll give a brief overview of my research that I did during my PhD. And then also to start to like throw in some seeds um, on the critical zone um, research. So my thesis explored how diverse ways of knowing and being with the Kells River, which is located in Cape Town, South Africa, is shaped and in, term, in turn shapes the river. So managed, management in this context of Cape Town and in South Africa, management of water in pipes and rivers, and the development of water infrastructure are deeply rooted in the societal development agendas that over time have been embedded in discourses of empire, economic growth, state formation, sustainability, and technol te technological efficiency. So when river management is informed by different agendas, the practice of management then differs across different levels of governance, research communities, and multiple meanings of different forms of human water relationships emerge. So my study, my PhD study examines how the resulting tangle of meanings impacts river management practices in Cape Town and in turn, turn how this shapes the well-being of people and more than human communities living in and with the river. So the specific questions that are asked in my research are what are the diverse ways of knowing and relating to this particular river, the Kells River, and how are these diverse ways of knowing and rela um, relating enacted? 
um, drawing from Anne Marie Marie Mole's uh, notion of the um, the body multiple. Um, so how does this shape river and capital flows? How does it shape governance and the well-being of multi-species communities? So it drew on ethnographic fieldwork for three years, um, archival research in doing some water testing in the Kills River um, catchment area. And I was exploring how politics, technology, and the environment are impacted by river management practices in Cape Town and how these produce different versions of the river, which in turn shape every day, the everyday of the kills and how it is manage, um, managed. So that was essentially my um, PhD research. But where I'm going now is to look at the critical zones work, which essentially is the study of material flows. Um, between the bedrock, so underneath, so from your um, aquifers all the way up into the air, and how uh, materials flow through that space. But the challenge with looking at critical zones research is often that it excludes the human. It happens with, you know, the focus is on just, um, you know, the natural aspect. So the next phase of my research is to look at how the human is a part of that, how politics, how technology, human technologies, how, um, you know, how regulations affect you know the flows of materials within these spaces and that's what I want to be doing for my like the next couple of years. Thank you Nikki well you guys are great at sticking to the time slot okay <laughs> thank you very much um there's still no Anna all right uh Rui, Rui Sa from the University of Lisbon. Yes so uh, greetings, everyone. I hope uh, Clara will recover soon. And thank you for the invitation and uh, all the organizers to for setting this up. Uh, so I'd like to start by sharing a quick, a quick picture with you, if it is possible. Um, okay. Are you seeing it? Okay, perfect. So. Um, this photograph that you are uh, actually seeing could be metaphorically considered a wounded uh, landscape. And why wounded, wounded? So notice that is in this riverine gallery, uh, the first line, what you see, it's uh, acacias. And then on the second line, line on behind this landscape, you'll see um, eucalyptus. Uh, as the, the most representative trees uh, here. Um, so uh, this landscape that belongs to the Natura Network uh, classification system recognized by the European Union in the north center of Portugal in the Down River uh, area, um, the landscape was completely transformed after the terrible fires of 2017 that devastated Portugal, where the country was forced to ask for international help to fight the fire and where almost 100 people lost their lives. So instead of poplars, birches, oaks, and chestnut, chestnut trees, all the trees you can see in this river, uh, riverside gallery belong to invasive species. So invasive species show certain behaviors that characterize the, uh, them as very fast growing and adaptive uh, dispersal, uh, eliminating uh, native, uh, native species. And therefore, uh, they, they threat the, the local um, biodiversity. So, this behavior derived from these plants themselves, or it is simply an extension of our human invasive behavior. So it's this type of question that I'm currently interested. Uh, and I depart from the idea that is present in the Feral Atlas of Annette Singh that consider invasiveness as one of the main detonators of the, the age we are living in, the Anthropocene. Uh, so let me go back when this start, uh, this project uh, started. So during my first confinement in Lisbon, I was feeling what can perhaps be described as a nature deficit disorder. I was feeling disconnected, I was feeling sad, I was feeling anxious. And all I could think was that those 
uh, in the rural world uh, will be much better um, coping and dealing with the confinement with confinement than me uh, stuck in my flat in Lisbon. So I began to wonder how those people who had experienced another natural fire tragedies a few years ago uh, were leaving that, uh, this currently uh, moment. I start making contacts uh, between classes and endless hours spent in Zoom. Um, I had the idea to start conversations with people from that region that I know very well because I also belong to the region. So I start to make uh, informal interviews and talking with them because I have this romantic vision that um, they are at least in contact with nature. And the answers I, I got it was really different from, from what I was, uh, I was expecting. Um, they were saying to me, well, look, this is even said uh, more said here because we feel the, the plague in the air, the COVID, but we also feel it in the trees, eucalyptus. We are surrounded by eucalyptus. These are not, no forests no longer. What we only see is eucalyptus. So this is not nature, it's something different. And that, that kind of answer is, was really strong and striking. Let me just quote one passage, and then I stopped, and I have other uh, things here that I want to share. The, this student I interview tells me um, this. The trend that invasive species will become more and more problematic in the future. Last, For example, last year, they were already less problematic than this year. And as time goes, goes on, they grow. It's urgent that we deal with this issue because if we don't look at the region, uh, we may have uh, in two or five, five or six years, this will all burn down again. And then I don't know how it's going to be, honestly. I think we are on our own. The forest has been abandoned and so have we. So this feeling of something cruel happen on this landscape as a name. It's called solastalgia. And uh, uh, this type of feelings is what is uh, in, it currently interests me, how the landscape can be injured and how this type of natural injuries are hurting mentally people. So I'll stay for here now and then we can uh, Discuss. We'll have another. You will have another chance and questions. Yes. Uh, can somebody? Uh, oh, there. Great. Thank you. So, okay, Andrea, you're next. Zuri, I'm getting better. Just, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? No. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, so I'd like to thank the organizers and especially Clara Saraiva for setting this up and I hope she gets better soon. Uh, I, I also had some difficulties in, in trying to elaborate a few ideas in to speak in four minutes, especially that I believe <laughs> anthropology in the so-called natural world is a rather complex issue, but uh, I understand the the idea is to provoke a debate, and my role here is to bring a perspective from my positioning within this academic and political field in Brazil. For a long time, we have been discussing the environmental crisis, which appears to be a crisis of civilization, given the already perceptible and increasingly intense and interrelated effects of climate change. Globally, Inequalities are increasing because there is no longer sufficient space left to expand the extractive frontier, and there are no cheap alternatives to fossil fuels. We are close to breaking the bio biophysical limits that make life possible because resources have been grabbed by a minority of the globe. The close link between the concentration of resources such as land and water, the new realities forced by climate change and increasing inequalities in the world cannot be ignored. 
So I would like to argue that the ecological question is a political issue and must be understood and dealt with as such. This is nothing new, especially for those who are being researching from the ecolog political ecology perspective since the 20th century. But um, the power dimensions of social and environmental relations has become more evident today in the face of the growing crisis and the ways in which the environment is disputed in society. The Amazon rainforest has been devastated at an accelerating uh, rate every day. And in the last four years, with the support of anti-environmental and anti-indigenous policies in Brazil as government policies, the deregulation of environmental protection promotes the destruction of the ecologically sustainable livelihoods of indigenous peasants and farming communities in Brazil and other countries in Latin America. These groups have always had a co-evolution link with the natural world. Thus, as their conditions of existence has been undermined, the codes of nature conservation that are part of a mutual relationship with the natural environment have also been weakened in a way that we must speak today of processes of ecocide and ethnocide. The peoples of the South who depend on natural resources as their source of life and livelihoods face the destruction, diversion, and appropriation of their ecosystems. This generates social environmental inequalities that are generally imposed on impoverished rural groups and slum dwellers in large cities. Indeed, the intersectionality of class, gender, race, and ethnicity must be highlighted in anthropological works about human relations to the natural, the so-called natural world. We are at a time of great change in perceptions and sensitivities around the environmental issue. The sources of social trust that in the past made it acceptable to sacrifice the web of life for the promise of indefined progress have been shattered. It is no longer possible to trust that technology can solve these civilizational challenges and that environmental costs can be postponed until tomorrow on the assumption that science can always push the frontier of expansion in resource extraction a little farther. Different social and environmental groups, movements and communities in Latin America and especially in Brazil have been confronting the generalized destruction of the natural world in several and innovative ways. Anthropology and other social sciences have still to deal with the social and political, the social and political constructions, images, narratives, and also ontologies that, that are woven into the mobilizations in defense of the environment. There is a call for an epistemic turn demanding from us a deconstruction of thought, in this case of hegemonic, Western, capitalist, patriarchal thought, which is a task that obliges us to assume a radical position and also a public stand in such matters in the sense, this radical position in the sense of diving to the bottom of the questions that trouble are present for an effective engagement with reality in the hope that in this way, we will be able to open paths to ideas that postpone the end of the world as the indigenous writer Ailton Krenaki invite us to do. I shall stop here uh, with these first ideas. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Alex. Still no uh, Anun. So Alex, I think. It's <clears throat> yeah, thank you. This is a, it's a fascinating group of people. So many various, variously different perspectives. I really appreciated uh, Paul starting out uh, with uh, you know some reservations as to how this is all going to fit together. But I, I now that I'm the last one in this round, I can see how things are starting to fit together. Um, I think I'll build on Andrea's uh, comment and uh, summary of the kind of work that she's uh, um, involved in. Anthropocene is a key term that's come up several times in different people's contributions already. And uh, just this overall dismay uh, at where the world is at in terms of our broken relationship with the environment. I think these are 
themes that resonate throughout the contribution so far. And I think we will come back to that. Unlike most of the presenters so far uh, who take quite a, uh, let's say, uh, eco-political stance, uh, uh, you know, uh, from political ecology, et cetera, my research is less uh, concerned with the politics of our relationship to whatever we want to use the term nature, perhaps, uh, or the environment. Uh, and I'm, I'm coming more from a linguistic standpoint or maybe a post-linguistic standpoint. What I'm really interested in are the same questions, however, and that is uh, not how can we stop, stall, or reverse um, our, our, our um, current predicament uh, as, as human society on this uh, planet, but um, what is there for us to rediscover in what we as a race, as the human race, as a species may already have known for millennia, going back into deep time, if you wish, about our communication with other than humans. Uh, so, you know, whether you look at this from a technological standpoint or from, from a political ecological standpoint, what I hear in Andrea's contribution is that our ontological perception of what it means to relate and what it means to be alive as part of the world, uh, something's gone awry, something's broken, something in the communication is, is has gone down uh, and uh, like a Zoom call that is suffering from interference or somebody doesn't know how to uh, turn on their mic or the video doesn't work. We seem to have that kind of trouble with the world that we live in. And like Andrea said, I think very correctly, technology has not offered any satisfying solutions in rectifying this uh, disconnect. So the, uh, the study that, um, I just started actually, it's a new five-year project with uh, my uh, collaborator, um, uh, uh, Sarah Abbott here at the University of Regina is concerned with rediscovering interspecies communication. And when I say interspecies communication, we're really interested in plant-human uh, communication as well as in animal-human uh, uh, communication. And what, the focus point, the focal point of this research is going to be is somatic communication. So we're really interested in how the body is used, how, how living beings, whether they are um, uh, plants or, or various animals, whether they fly or swim or dive or walk or whatever it is, or slither, um, how different species are able to develop and pass on a knowledge a, a kind of reading knowledge of other bodies in the landscape. So what can we learn uh, from various societies about their uh, ethnoethology or their ethnoethology uh, or ethno -ethno -ethno ethnology as uh, ethology as we say. So the kind of knowledges that have existed over generations, uh, the kind of teachings that have been passed on to the next generation about how to properly interpret the meaning of movement in the landscape, um, how plants spread, but also how animals group together and how different, say for instance, circadian rhythms across species can be orchestrated to work together in multi-species households as an example. And so with Paul here, I take a pretty critical perspective on this wild tame dichotomy. In fact, I've written a book about that beyond wild and tame uh, where uh, through my South Siberian field work, I try to question this um, rather clear cut dichotomy between that is rooted in Western uh, ontologies uh, about the environment that certain species have been denatured, a term that Paul used uh, and equates with domestication. And um, to be a little bit provocative, I might question that and would be happy to discuss that further on. Uh, what does it mean um, to, to have a species that's domestic, especially if you look at societies that don't even use words in their language uh, to, to, um, to describe what is domestication, but who use a very different approach. So for instance, who, who look at animals in relation to their habitat. So who speak of animals of the forest or animals of the water bodies or animals of the air. Uh, and um, 
or of the house, of the home or near the home or things like that. But where there are no clear cut lines between this is a denatured animal and this is a wild animal in its natural habitat. So I guess what I'm trying to do is A, problematize what is naturalness and what is perturbation. Uh, both terms used in the natural sciences quite freely. <clears throat> yes. Uh, so that gives you an idea of, of the angle that, that I'll be contributing to our discussion here. Thank you, uh, Virginia. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, don't worry. Um, I, I know that uh, Michelle has emailed Anu, just in case there may be a time zone problem, but uh, she's still not here. So let's uh, proceed to sort of the second round. Generally, what we do in these webinars in the second round is uh, still pretty much stick to the, the speakers. And uh, Clara has always gone again from east to west. So we'll follow the same process here. But what, what uh, each speaker contributes may depend. It could be something you have prepared uh, that you want to add. It could be responding to some other things here. So uh, you could be more or less provocative. You can use this time about the same. And you know, you have all really been very good about time. So uh, Paul, we'll start with you again. Right. Um, well, I don't have I didn't have anything prepared because I had no idea where this was going. Um, uh, but the one thing I would say, I guess going hearkening back to what I was talking about at the start, would be I would be, and I guess this is directed towards Andrea, but I want to be clear that it's not a negative comment, right? I mean, I think it was probably pretty obvious from, from what I first said that there's a kind of danger, I think, in, um, I guess what I'm saying is when I think of my own work, I try to make my work as depolitical as possible, as, as de-activist as possible. And the reason for that is because I think um, the data itself so someone would have a very hard time, in other words, reading anything that I've written ethnographically about industrial far dairy farming to think that I am in favor of industrial dairy farming. But I don't come out with an activist sort of standpoint. It's just, it's there in the data, right? Once you have manure lagoons, once you have de-skilled workers, once you have these abused animals, you don't really need to take this activist standpoint. And I, I, I would say there's a kind of danger in, in doing that. On the second point that I would, I would, I'd like to, to bring up kind of runs through all the papers and it's this idea of the, the Anthropocene. And I wanna kind of, and maybe it's, it's tied in a little bit to the last, um, the last comment, which is this idea of um, what is this dichotomy between nature and denature, right? Or between domestication and natural. And I would say that when I think about something like industrial farming, or you think about something like you know, companion animal keeping practices, you're looking at a pretty extreme version there of, of, of domestication. And I think that does stand out aside from what we think about nature or living in a more natural kind of environment. But this idea of, Rui's idea of invasive species really got me thinking about the Anthropocene um, in general, right? And there is this sort of image that tends to come up that nature is in some way this kind of non-changing thing, this sort of self-governing system, but actually everything is an invasive species. I mean, any, any human being outside of Africa is an invasive species. So I, I always kind of wonder about these um, changes in the environment or these taking over of, you know, invasive species in a new space. Is this not just evolution? It's just, this is just a process that's been going on for, you know, the, the entirety of the, of, the, of, of the history of the earth. Right? Um, so I guess that's all. What, and the other thing I'd say is a lot of something that I, I'm focused on that maybe not a, a lot of people um, in anthropology have focused on is One Health. Um, and sort of my focus, what I'm looking at right now is moving towards this direction of One Health, which is basically looking at humans, non-humans and ecology as a kind of system. It's coming out of veterinary studies, but I mean, um, I'm, I've been looking at that in the sort of idea, it's a Japanese concept of Ikigai, which Gordon Matthews, if he's here, knows very well, but the history of Ikigai has tended to focus on human social relationships. And I've been trying to look at how that could be extended to um, 
for example, relationships with more with 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 non-human others, but also relationships, affective relationships with an environment. Um, what draws people to live in a certain environment that otherwise people think is lacking in some way? Um, so yeah, I think I'd leave it there for now and see where other people take this. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, okay, Nikiwe, given Anu's continued absence, you're next. Hey? Yes. Um, so I think um, Andrea would be able to respond um, or, you know, speak to what Paul has said. But um, I just wanted to speak to um, the aspect of activism and um, the kind of work um, that's being done, well, in my own personal experience and the research that I've done. So when I started my research, my interest was in these relationships between um, the river and you know, politics, technology, and people that were living um, along the river. But when you start to see these um, pockets of injustice, um, and I, uh, you know, as an academic that is um, paid by public funds, um, there's always this imperative to be able to this responsibility, ability to respond to the kind of injustices that are being acted out on the ground, and um, like. For me, in in, within the context of the Anthropocene, within the context of you know the kind of politics around race, around um, gender issues, it's imperative that the work that I do on a personal level actually um, benefits um, the people that are paying me through their taxes to, to do the work. Um, so yeah, that's just some of the thought that I had. And in terms of um, you know looking at the Anthropocene and some of the types of logics in terms of how um, you know, governance happens or how, you know, management practices happen in that space, you know, in, in the case of Brazil, um, you know, how farming happens or wherever you are, these have geological effects, right? We are living an imprint on the land as human beings, and these are geological effects that are going to be experienced by future generations, and it can't help but be political, it is political because people are inheriting these damaged landscapes. And how do we respond as anthropologists in this moment, in this time, um, to these kinds of um, stresses? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Andrea, you're not quite next, but you have noticed that uh, a lot of the speakers <laughs> have uh, responded to you. So, Rui, I think, I think you're next, right? Yes. So, uh, well, more than intervention, I have several questions here that I would like to share with you. Um, Paul, your, your idea of uh, um, invasive species being um, um, an act of evolution, it's interesting. I was thinking about that as well. But then I was wondering, so what about then the concept of biodiversity itself? So the forests, the gardens, um, if they are being dominated uh, by these uh, species, um, where do we really put biodiversity there? So uh, that uh, is um, an interesting thing that we need to deal, although because, because um, uh, invasive species has a, a lot of uh, economic influence uh, as well. Um, Alex mentioned here something, he, he said that something in the communication is going down. And I agree with this because Currently, we are being bombed by these buzzwords, like this idea, for example, from the EPCC, climate resilient development. What exactly is a climate resilient development? Or nature-based solutions, I love this one. Uh, because everything on when we apply for funding, they ask, okay, what are the the nature-based solutions. And for example, rewilding. Rewilding is the perfect idea of nature-based solution. But for example, in this case, in the central north part of Portugal, rewilding that area after the, the, the wildfires, what will happen is that the, the landscape will be completely transformed from, uh, from even the perception, the memory of the people, and they are creating other injuries. Uh, so, yes, I think there is a, a communication uh, problem here. Um, I don't, these enmeshments in uh, these ideas of uh, 
nature-based solutions, climate resilient developments. Uh, um, I have doubts about this, and perhaps together we wish we need to think what these exactly mean and how do we interpret them because probably uh, each one of us are interpreting them in a, in a different way. Um, I also agree with uh, the, uh, with Alex, Alex this uh, um, binarism of natural versus perturbation. Uh, Although there are some theoretical um, movements, uh, eco queer, for example, that says that there is a continuum, and if we continue to use these categories, we are creating fake discontinuities. So this is also a, a, an interesting point of view. But uh, in a more pr a pragmatic way, perhaps I would like to ask you, and because me here in Portugal, several colleagues of mine, uh, they are making real uh, efforts to, um, for the anthropologists to have a voice, uh, especially in the environmental impact assessment processes. So I would like to ask you, how is in your countries? You as anthropologists, as uh, in, in a collective, do you intervene in these uh, environmental um, impact assessments or not? Because I think uh, it's something that it's useful for us to share and learn with, with each other. Really oh, I, I'll stay here. Okay, thank you, Rui. Uh... Andrea. <laughs> yeah. Ah, hello. Ah. <laughs> I said the idea was to provoke. <laughs> you were so uh, provoking. Help, yes. help to provoke the debate, but I wasn't expecting that much. Anyway, as I said in the beginning, uh, uh, my contribution, my contribution to the debate comes from my positioning in the field of anthropology in Brazil, in, coming from Brazil in Latin America. So as Donna Haraway long taught us that the production of knowledge doesn't come from nowhere. We are immersed in society, in, in historic and political uh, networks. So our knowledge, the production of knowledge is not, it's not possible, Paul, to be depoliticized. I, I don't really like these labels. I've, at all. I, I, I prefer to say that we have a position in, in society as we have in the field of anthropology. In anthropology have a stand in, in history since the beginning, since colonialism and imperialism. So uh, yeah, we have to, to, to have a stand in public, in public issues. And uh, I believe your position is also a political position. You chose to have this, this this position. And I believe that you can do so because you don't come from the South. You come from a Northern country, you work in Japan, you work within a, a scene which allows you to be absent, to be distant from violence, sheer violence. Right now, two people are missing in the Amazon, an anthropologist and a British journalist. They are missing since Sunday. This is for real. This is where I live. This is where I stand. This is the environment struggle here in Brazil. So I speak about a, a, a very strong context of violence and injustice and, and more than injustice, people are dying. People are being killed. Uh, this is, there is a human right issue here, if you like, if you want to use this label, human right. So anthropology cannot be mute about it. So we have a lot to say about it. Because also anthropologists, they have been working for the powerful people, entrepreneurs, and also, you know, working and being persecuted by their opponents. So we are in the middle of a war here, a resource war, a territorial war here in Brazil. So it's, it's a huge context. And I'd like to provoke Alex to perhaps move a little bit in speaking about the Anthropocene perhaps moving a little bit from biology or the natural sciences from the category of species towards history and, and the idea of social formations and historical processes 
So we can really speak about the Anthropocene in a different manner as already mentioned by Nikiwi uh, from South Africa, which I really appreciate your, your position, Nikiwi. So we are standing in the, in the South position here. <laughs> Perhaps there's a clash here, I don't know. Anyway, this is a false dichotomy. I don't want to go through this, but let me say a few words here. As I said before in my first intervention, there is a claim for epistemic turn. There, there are some movements going on. And the idea is to, for, for us here, is to question some um, notions that is very dear to the, to, to the germonic thought. The ideas, for example, of development and progress. We need to deconstruct these ideas, to confront these ideas of development and progress. We, indigenous knowledges invite us to look at mining, for example, with a different eye, as an activity that does not extract food from the earth, but releases disease, evil, death, as noted by Shaman Davi Kopenawa. My, by mixing this indigenous understanding, knowledge, with an anthropological approach, we can say that new extractivism, as, a we, as well as hydroelectric dams and other large projects in the name of development, they are centered on uh, a commodity economy that involve immense financial investments at a transnational level and demand a lot of land and water to produce abstract wealth for a few people in the world. These enterprises, therefore, require large territories. And this is a core and conflictive issue, the demand for territory and the type of territoriality that mining and other large projects represent, they clash uh, directly with the te multiple territorialities of the different social groups that in fact comprise the Brazilian nation state. This process, which David Harvey calls uh, accumulation by dispossession, has some central elements that I have been calling violence of affects, violencia das afetações, because it refers to something that goes beyond expropriation, beyond material violence. There are processes that give rise to a set of other associated forms of violence, which are symbolic, epistemic, social, physical, psychological, emotional, cultural violence. It is necessary then to analyze this process in their complexity and multi-scale dimensions in order to understand in a radical way that they can only be accomplished through the elimination of the ways of life of other social groups, groups which have a territorialized existence. These are processes that unleash ecocide and ethnocide, a violence which is proper to them. Therefore, violence is not an unintended consequence of these projects, which could, in theory, if well managed, not be violent. Violence is an intrinsic and constitutive part of these colonizing projects. By depriving the other of land, water, soil, a garden, a house, the other is also deprived of memory, knowledge, the possibility of reproduction as a social subject and as a group. We are talking about various types of death. In the process of installation or operation of these large projects, different strategies are activated, even that of letting die by successive impediments and imposed needs, such as difficulties in access to water, which is always common in these cases. Okay. There are strategies to make life inviolable. I'm finishing places which anthropology has identified as forms of displacement in situ. So if the critical and epistemic exercise that seeks to deconstruct the buildings of dominant thought opens up breaches to foresee cracks and exist and exits for the future ongoing experiments in Latin America also signal directions for change. There are varied forms of resistance and creative ways of organizing and thinking the paths of tomorrow. Some dimension of these, I will conclude, are four, three, four dimensions. First, the, the, these experiments, they trigger new repertoires that intervene the social, intervene, intervene, interweave, interweave the social and the environment in the denunciation of environmental inequality. There are struggles that inscribe the territory in environmental conflicts. 
that resist enclosures and defend the spaces of freedom represented by the commons. They also question the hegemonic form of scientific knowledge. They combine tradition and scientific knowledge as indigenous and Quilombola writings themselves uh, come uh, uh, show us. No? In the in this specific sphere of political organization, many political movements challenge the hegemonic forms of doing politics and the forms of state governance. And, and last but not least, another dimension of these struggles and forms of knowledge production points to a Latin American feminist political ecology under construction. So Thank you. I believe that anthropology has much to gain from engaging with these issues. No? Uh, from as, uh, because after all, culture sits in places, as Arturo Escobar long noted. Anthropology has to gain by engaging with initiatives and in different scales, analysis of power relations in different scales, as Eric Wolf has long also provoked us to do. Okay. Sorry about it, my time limit here. <laughs> I had to respond to the provocation. I, I, I understand. Okay. Alex, you're next. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, fascinating perspectives there, all of them very, very important. I really appreciate Andrea's uh, uh, challenge for us as anthropologists, especially those who are in the North, to uh, remain fully aware of the war that we're actually waging globally. So I couldn't agree more with you, Andrea. I think this is accurate also of the North, not just of the Global South. Um, and there are different ways of responding to that and different ways of engaging with that very real challenge. I think um, political anthropology, obviously, and approaches such as those of your own uh, are very well suited to respond to that. And I, I can only applaud the way in which you take up that responsibility through activism and engage it as an anthropologist. And I think Nikiwe uh, is doing pretty much the same in South Africa. So I, I, this is, you know, you're a great example to certainly anthropologists like myself who are situated in the North. Um, personally, and here maybe I would take sides a little bit with Paul, uh, for those of us who may not be immediately affected uh, by our neighbors being kidnapped on the Amazon or things like that, uh, although many of us are still affected by great injustices such as the onslaught of the Russian Federation onto Ukraine right now, for many of us who have done field work in those areas. So I, I would say many of us in the Global North too are um, almost directly aware of and um, uh, affected by these kinds of, of absolute violent explosions. But I wanna take it back to this word of violence that uh, Andrea has introduced into this discussion. And, and I also agree with violence, you know, uh, and, and, and silencing specifically. I think what we are facing, the, the aftermaths and the ongoing uh, violence of colonialism, both in the global North and the global South, uh, they, they have to do, they are rooted in silencing. And to me, that again speaks to this breakdown in communication that I was referring to earlier. And this is something that goes beyond the human species, obviously. So while I applaud those who point out the direness of the situation in which we find ourselves as the human race, I also, as an anthropologist, believe that we are uniquely positioned to contribute building blocks towards a future and a future path forward together. And of course, this future path forward together has to look at what has silencing caused. What, in, in what ways are we still silencing? We can say, okay, we want to tackle this injustice that is, is causing uh, the Anthropocene, but that in itself, solve it and i'm not saying we have the tools to solve it right away but but can how where do we even start to build these tools and what can anthropology contribute towards the building of these tools and i think one of the things that perhaps we do quite well in our discipline is to listen to listen carefully and to make room for non-conventional or marginalized uh suppressed repressed voices and i think that's what you are doing uh in brazil in south africa um, and that's what we are trying to do here in the Global North as well. So what does it mean to learn anew to listen? And that takes us back to this response ability, the ability to respond, not for us to respond. The ones that are in power as humans, we've been responding 
all the time. I shouldn't say respond. We've been imposing our own voices. We've been extracting, but not extracting, not exchanging. And so what does it mean to, to regain the ability to listen, to observe, especially those who, who either don't speak a language because uh, they are a plant or they are a bedrock. Um, for instance, I work with uh, indigenous people in Southern Siberia who are very much involved, involved. with mining, but who too believe that uh, rock responds and has a response ability, an ability to respond. So when you talk about mining, when you talk about natural resource extraction, it is a conversation. It is an ancient conversation that ancestors have had and that must be kept in balance today. So there is a kind of vocabulary. There is a kind of language that we have to relearn. How do we actually engage with that rock? How can we make sure that we don't violate the other, in this case, rocks? How do we learn to listen to rocks and respond to, to rocks in equitable ways? This, of course, will revolutionize the mining industry. And we have a lot of that based here in Canada, diamond mines, you know, all kinds of mines in the global north. And these are all examples of silencing the natural world. There is no discourse. There is no true exchange, no back and forth, no listening, no responding to the needs of non-humans. So my question and my challenge as an anthropologist is, how can we respond to that? How can we build tools that allow us to relearn, to engage with the other and thereby tackle injustice? So that in a nutshell is, uh, uh, I, I think, one of the ways in which Anthropologists, even in the global north, can work towards constructing new building blocks to reinvigorate, to relearn what it means to communicate in an equitable way. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I, there are some questions in the chat that I want to get to uh, very soon, but uh, I, I just wanted to say it's interesting. I hope all of the speakers have noticed that you all have some things in common, but I love debate and disagreement. Uh, as well, and I also see and hear uh, some of the issues concerning this. So one of them, uh, one of them. Let me let me turn to uh, to the chat. Uh, I I don't know that uh, that we can give people a word. So I'm going to Muxi Spiegel uh, in South Africa uh, has a question: Is there a global South? global north tension here, or is there something else behind this dichotomy? Anybody? No? It's not provocative <laughs> enough? Go oh. ahead, Andrea. Oh, well, no. <laughs> Who was that, Alex? I don't know. Let me try to have this be orderly. You're both smiling. Well, several of you are smiling. Andrea, uh, go ahead. Is there a global? There are a lot of questions here, but I, perhaps I, sh I, I can comment in one or two things. I don't understand this this label of activism. Activism. What does it mean? Activism. What I'm wait, speaking. Wait, wait. Can about... we stick? To, can we stick to this question for a minute? This it, question. Yeah. Global. Uh, global North, Gordon. Or, yeah. No, 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 no. Muncie Spiegel. Oh, it, it, it was early on. Is there a global South global North tension here, or is there something else behind this dichotomy? I know Monksy has been act active. In, no, Andrea, I think you basically were suggesting <laughs> that you and Nikiwe have a different have a different. Uh, we have a different engagement, perhaps different engagement, you know, because uh, we produce anthropology from our experience ethnographic experience in our society i don't know i don't know the other maybe I can, <laughs> i'm i'm just guessing from our common common perspective but not only that that we uh knowledge for me is situated as i said it's situated there's no other way of producing knowledge so you are standing you have a standpoint you have a, you have a position in 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 society so the, the idea that you can produce something rather rather neutral, rather rather above society is a little bit uh, absurd for me. I mean, such a little bit 19th century discourse. I'm sorry about that, but I don't think that anybody suggested that, but I'm just bringing this to the, to the 
the idea that you can speak from nowhere to to nobody is it's it's not really real not can really I, real I and, and, I, and, I, and i don't think that to to make it to make it clear the the position that one's stand is not only ethical but it's methodological correct okay. so you can really have a debate about what's going on so you have to make it to make it clear uh, 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 what is your position within a certain uh, milieu, yeah? with a, uh, with, within a certain context. Uh, and, and this is, I think, uh, Andrea, epistemologically- I, I was going to actually uh, ask Paul, but now he has raised his hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think I might have been unclear when I said depoliticized, right? I'm not trying to make some claim that I'm somehow that you know the a cipher of objective knowledge, right? I mean, I don't think there are many anthropologists that don't claim anthropology that ethnography is central, or that they're somehow they don't have a position in the field. Um, that wasn't that wasn't my point. What what I meant by um, depoliticized was your anthropology can't take one side. It can't be a one-sided anthropology. So even the whole idea that I'm at war with these people and um, the global south versus the global north. I mean, I understand that from your perspective and that's fine. I mean, I started my paper or started my, 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 my talk by, by outlining I'm in a colonial space. I mean, that's where I am doing research, right? So I guess my question to you then as a, as a you know, clearly a, an impassioned uh, activist on, on the part of your the people that you study, what's your end goal? Because if your end goal is to try and influence people, if your end goal is to try and, um, you know, as, as Alex was saying, to, you know, conversation and sort of building blocks for conversation, I think by telling people that, um, you know, there's this dichotomy between the global south, the global north, you can't understand this, we're at war, all of these sorts of ways of provoking. All, I'm, all I was saying is when I write about, for example, industrial agriculture, or when I write about, for example, companion animal keeping, there are of course dark negative sides to these things. And I, I, they speak for themselves, right? So if you're, gonna, if you're writing something, for example, and you are against industrial agriculture, the best way to turn off, <laughs> to turn off, um, people in government to turn off people who are in those industries to affect any kind of change other than your activist circle, right? The, the way to shut those people off is to engage in this sort of um, confrontational kind of discourse, right? The facts will speak for themselves. Yeah. You know, that's the point, that's the point I was making, right? That's the point I'm making. I'm not trying to draw some and I certainly wouldn't make any distinction that I know anything about Brazil or South Africa, but I do know a little bit about the history of Hokkaido. And I don't think that I'm, I, in any way I'm saying that I'm above my own positionality or I'm, I'm uh, that, that anthropologists can't, that, that anthropological work doesn't, can't make a political statement, but making an overt political statement and talking about basically one side of a picture. So for me to do research, for example, on industrial agriculture, on, on industrial farmers, and and never listen to the opinions or or the the ideas that industrial farmers have about their relationship with animals would be a pretty odd ethnography, right? So that that was my point. I mean, I I, I actually really appreciate your your point of view. I'm just saying that's not the approach. Can I ask a that question? I Can I ask wait, a question? Wait, wait, let, so let's, which, let's, I mean, I guess my I, I should have I rambled. I mean, my wait, main question is facts. What What's are your goals? Andrea, you wait, wait. Goals? I want to let other people in. I, I want to let other people in both. I, I, I rambled. I should have just, I left it. I should have left it what it is, which is what is your goal? What, I mean, if yeah. your goal is to convince other activist anthropologists that these are bad practices, then it's a great job. Good. Can we let Nikiwa in here? She's been very active in the chat as well as speaking here. Right. Um, yeah, that's a, a bit difficult to respond to but speaking from somebody that has um, been part of the roads must fall movement a part of you know um you know science must fall all of these movements student movements that are calling for decolonial approaches 
we had to have a reckoning within the discipline of anthropology in our um, university about you know the role of anthropology in the production of knowledge and also in our positionality as subjects that living are living in a space of massive in, injustices. South Africa is seen as one of the most unequal um, spaces in the world. Um, Cape Town, where I live, is the most unequal city in, in, in the country. So how can I have this standpoint that, um, you know, sees um, the, 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 be neutral when it comes to you know certain um, injustices that are happening on the ground and people have been speaking um i think it was alex who was talking about how do we listen how do we learn to listen people have been speaking for a very long time they've been talking about these um inequalities these injustices yeah. it's now us are we actually ready to listen are we really ready to pay attention to the kinds of um, problems that as people are experiencing on the ground and how does my my role as an anthropologist, a person of color, a person, a woman in these spaces, I can't take a, a um, like this is my pers own um, personal experience and like, um, like Andrea was talking about, about the positionality, my position as a black woman in South Africa, there's no ways I can just go into the spaces that I do research and I see the kind of injustices to people that look like me that are, um, and um, 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 policies that are being developed and um, the research that I'm doing is not going to speak to the kind of policies that are being developed that are going to affect the people on the ground. So again, it comes back to the situated knowledge. How are these, um, you know, frameworks for policies that are being developed removed from the people on the ground? How does my work, how does my role as an anthropologist that is working on the ground speak to the policies that are so removed that are happening from the ground, you know, the God's eye view of determining how people interact with the environment. On the ground, people are experiencing um, these issues on their bodies. So how does my work, um, like, I don't know if I can ever be neutral when it comes to that because it actually affects people's bodies. And um, we're talking about violence as well. It's not just this instantaneous violence that we're looking at, but also slow violence, what Rob Nixon talks about, it's a generational thing. And the imperatives is to respond um, in the moment that I have with the privilege I have. I have privilege with being an academic in this space. I have the privilege of having a degree and there's an authority that comes with my knowledge, with my position as an academic, as a researcher. So how do I use that um, for the sake of the people I'm working with, rather than continuing these extractive relationships of, you know, the anthropologists going out there into the field and working with communities and taking um, knowledge from these communities? How do I give back? How do, how do, how, what is my response ability um, to the situations on the ground? Thank you, Nikki. Where uh, you're being very quiet, can I ask you? Do you have any thoughts about any of this? Um, yes, I was wondering um, on the or uh, the initial question from Maxi, if there is a, a tension between the the global south and global north. I think yes, uh, there is a tension, but not here particularly in the in the in our webinar, but uh, a general tension politically, economically. This tension exists. We need to recognize it. Uh, the, the, colonial, uh, the, colonial, uh, the colonial approach, it's uh, um, a way we can deal with, it, uh, and I agree with it. Um, all the time, Andrea mentioned, and I think she's very right, it's what the Boventura Sousa Santos says as a, a business side. So there is really a business side going on because the global north doesn't recognize, for example, indigenous knowledge as knowledge. So, uh, yes, there is a tension and uh, we need to, to find ways to deal with this kind of tension. Alex proposed that uh, uh, we need, to, we as anthropologists, we listen, although I understand as well uh, the vision from Nikwe, when she says, but people are, are, uh, are talking, uh, perhaps we didn't list, listen in the way we should. Um, yes, something uh, we need to look to these different uh, things. I agree in, in from one side that perhaps we need to see better, listen carefully and uh, go back in history 
and uh, try to, to see where people start talking about this type of violence, this type of invisibility, uh, because this tension for me is quite visible and apparent. Thank you, Rui. Uh, there are a number of questions about ethics and politics in the chat, but I, I want to take uh, a little bit advantage of my, my role here as moderator to ask a question. Why are you guys still anthropologists? I mean, I don't know. Y you're not all centering things on humans. Um, but, you know, I, I think many anthropologists think that our anthropological duty is to study humans, to listen to humans, but you know, I'm sorry, I, I don't think rocks talk to us. I don't actually think many animals actually talk to us. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I, in the way, I don't know that rivers talk to us. So, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, several of you said, you know, listening is an important thing, but uh, are we listening to humans dealing with uh, other kinds of beings in the environment? Am I just too provocative? Go ahead, Alex. You have to unmute them. I know Nikwe uh, also had her finger up. Okay, sorry. So okay. If you want to start, go ahead. Nikwe. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, why are we anthropologists? Um, I want to go back to um, what Rui is talking about, about indigenous thought and, um, um, you know, certain knowledge isn't considered as knowledge. But within the South African context, um, there's this um, notion of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is you are a person through other people, you are a person through your relationships. And it's not restricted to the relationships between people, but it's also you are made, you are a person, you are able to become a society because of more than just human relations. It's about the relationships that you have um, with the environment as well. Human beings would not exist without the environment. Human beings would not exist without the bugs that, you know, are in your stomach that make you healthy or without, you know, there's all sorts of relationships that are happening that make you human. And, and I think that's my position as in why I'm an anthropologist um, working with the environment because I am I am who I am because of my relationships, because of the environment that makes me me. Okay, thank you, Alex. Yeah, thank you very much, Nikki. You really nailed it. That's uh, essentially what I want to say as well. Um, here in in Canada, we usually refer to it uh, through the First Nations phrase, "all our relations," and the idea is that none of us could exist in the way that we do without each other. And when we say none, we refer not to the humans only. So this whole idea of anthropology, studying anthropos, I think is a 20th century or maybe even 19th century idea. And it is completely, completely and utterly outdated. I don't think this is where we're going with anthropology in the future. Certainly not in Canada is my hope. Um, and uh, I, I think many younger anthropologists would agree with this. Uh, and I'm not saying you have to become a post-humanist uh, necessarily, but uh, the realization that our future cannot uh, continue to silence other than human beings. And, and this takes me back to what is a building block? What does it mean to, to reconcile communication across the species boundaries? First of all, I think the species boundaries has never been very rigid. Like Nikki, we pointed out, um, genetically, the genetic matter in my organism uh, that is that can be traced to just myself perhaps amounts to you know debatably maybe 10 percent and the remaining 90 percent are all kinds of organisms that co-populate me so I can't ask who am I I should ask who are we uh, and and so in this kind of uh, narrative of who are we am I actually listening to us right and then, you know, listening is one thing. I think anthropologists have listened for a long time. And I think we've listened in quite good ways. Even in the 20th century, we have amazing ethnographies. Uh, but what does it mean to listen? Uh, shouldn't it be followed up with a response? And I'm addressing not only anthropologists here, but all disciplines. And I speak specifically into industry. And this takes me to Paul's actually work and where I think it can have immense effects on the future of our planet is how do we 
work across disciplines, say with engineers, for instance, bioengineers. Um, how can we infuse the kind of knowledge, the qualitative knowledge that ethnography can gain in the field between species into the plans, developments, uh, of engineering and of these kinds of industries to talk about milking apparatuses, for instance. Uh, wh what, how would the, the industrial design change if it actually took seriously the desires, the needs, the preferences, and the life quality from the perspective as much as we can ascertain that of dairy cows? You know, um, what is their relationship with grass? What is their rhythm of movement, what actually tastes good, what is desirable, and to what extent can humans even assess that? I think that's very much part of anthropology and very much part of the future of our own species on this planet. Okay, uh, it, it's, uh, it's now 10.30 here. Uh, it's half an hour, okay, we're all over the planet. But uh, I, I want to have, uh, um, I don't know, I want to ask one or two more questions in the chat. We can go over a little bit. Um, Gordon Matthews in Hong Kong. I, I don't know if he's still in Hong Kong, but he's normally in Hong Kong. He asks, does activism entail a single view of the world? This is this is officially I know, addressing Andrea, but I would like to open this. Uh, Rui, you, I saw you smiling, right? You want to say something? Uh, well, because... Uh... I was smiling because I cannot see uh, anthropology without being engaged. So, uh, um, of course, there is an engagement with the community I work, with the people I work. There is this engagement. I, I, I cannot make a, a separation between uh, what usually is labeled as activism and science. No, I produce knowledge from what uh, Andre uh, says as my point, my standing point there. And of course, I engage with, the, with the, the, my community. So for me, I don't see this as, a, as a, a clear separation. And I have doubts on that, I need to say. Uh, and of course, I don't adopt a positivist uh, vision, uh, anthropological uh, vision of seeing the other in that way. So I, of course, engage with the other. Yeah. Okay, Andrea, this was officially addressed to you as you promised. <laughs> Can you be yeah. brief? As it's now already passed. I, I totally agree with Rui. Thank you, Rui. <laughs> I, it's engagement and it's also responsibility. We have responsibility for what we say, what we write, we write testimonies. And what we write makes effects on, so, on power relations. At least here in Brazil, it makes a lot of effects for any kind of effects. So we must be responsible and responsive towards the knowledge we produce in this context. And second, we are demanded by the people we engage with. You know, first time I went to the Jequitinhonha Valley. Jequitinhonha Valley is one of the poorest areas of the world in the northeast of Minas Gerais. When I first went there with my students, they were threatened by a hydroelectric dam. And the people took me to this house of this old man. And um, he asked me, he begged me. Uh, this was a very senior person, very, it's what is kind of a chief of, of this locality. And uh, he begged me to help him to stop the dam. And then I told him, I was astonished. I, I was very young at the time. And I looked, my students were even younger. So we were in panic and we looked at the, I looked at him and I said, Seu Prudencio, his name, Seu Prudencio, do you understand I am only a teacher? And these are my students. I have no power. I have, I cannot stop the dam. But then he looked at me and he said, but you have a knowledge which I don't have. So you have more knowledge than I do and you have access. So you can really do something. You can really help us. And then I looked at him and said, well, so then we have to do it together because you, you have the knowledge I don't have about your place, about your locality. So uh, this is a kind of a pact that anthropologists 
must do and face while doing field work, really field work. We are engaged in field work. So people ask us to do things and, and to, to, uh, to ask us to, you know, to send the message uh, through the authorities and, and other, other, other people in power, in charge. So this is what I believe is engagement and to be responsible with uh, care about the, the, the scientific, all the, all the procedures, anthropolo anthropological procedures that we must be. No, we are not only reproducing what people say, we're not only, <laughs> uh, we, we are producing something different from what they are saying, but we, in somehow we are reverberating, echoing uh, a situation of violence and, and of the powerless uh, uh, of, of these contexts. And really facing large entrepreneurs, large groups, companies, mining companies, they can hire any anthropologist in the world. They can hire and they hire and they pay, they pay well. They pay really well to all sorts of engineers, biologists, etc. Local people can pay nothing. They pay nothing. So th this is an uneven situation here, an inequality of access to knowledge, to justice, to, to government, to, to, to everything. So they know that, and local people know that. I, I work with the people that suffer from the, the mining disaster here from Valley, one of the largest mining companies in the world. They have, there were a lot of disasters where I live, <laughs> at least two largest ones, one in 2015 and another one in 2019. 300 people died immediately. They were buried by a collapse of uh, this, the staling dams. And uh, nobody was, was responsible for this till today. Seven years from the Mariana disaster, three, four years from this Brumadinho disaster, and, and nobody was charged. Uh, uh, so we, 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 we are relating here with a huge, um, um, uh, sorry, this time pressure is a little bit too much for me, Virginia. I cannot formulate anything in English with this pressure. But anyway, I just want to bring power into the question here. Structures of power very well established historically, patterns of power, and with Bolsonaro, absolute lack of democracy in Brazil, absolute lack of democracy, and also racism. Last one, one last thing, please. There are two people missing in the Amazon since Sunday, one British and another anthropologist, both white people. Immediately, the federal police was made available to look for these people, to search these people, and that's what they have to do. But the Yanomami people have been dying, being raped, being sacrificed, in the same Amazon, and no federal police, nothing, no federal forces were moved to save these people. This is racism. This is absolutely racist. Some bodies, some people are sacrificed. Their, their bodies are given to sacrifice in the name of development for the reach of, of, of a few. That's, sorry. You, That's have, definitely, you have definitely gotten your point across. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, but I want to end with, uh, uh, you know, questions, comments from two people in the chat. One is, you know, just in the last minute or so, from Mungsi in uh, Cape Town and from Gordon in Hong Kong. So I'm just going to read these. I mean, you can read them. Mungsi writes, I'm sensing another tension here. Why is it our responsibility, as Andrea and Rui say, to the, quote, communities with whom we work, unquote, rather than to our whole social context, which includes our embeddedness in academic institutions that play ball with capitalist modernity. And Gordon, I don't know if he replied to this or to something else. Gordon uh, wrote, almost all engaged anthropology is coming from a common political perspective, it seems. Is that perspective necessarily correct? Maybe, but I worry that I can uh, exactly predict what anthropologists will say in advance. Anybody want to say anything about that? No. Are we just repeating ourselves? Alex, you look like you're thinking. Well, no, I'm, I mean, I, I read that and uh, this one-sidedness of anthropology, it, it takes us back to an old dichotomy, which I think is a simplification of the situation. 
it's never been that simple. It's very gray. Uh, the communities we work with, certainly in the global north, I can't speak for South America because I'm not well versed in that region. But here in, in indigenous uh, Canada, I shall say, uh, we have a lot of resource extraction that is highly contested. And it's contested by First Nations. Um, but to say all First Nations in all areas under all conditions are always opposed to it would be a gross simplicity, uh, simplification. Um, it's very complicated. There are lots of payrolls that people need to receive to feed their children. So, you know, talking about a mine, about oil extraction or gas or pipelines or things like that. Uh, I lived in the Western Canadian Arctic for a number of years and one of the in indigenous uh, businesses there uh, is a transportation company and another one, a construction company. These are Inuit owned companies. They're amazing companies. They have great vision and they sustain their society, their, their, their community. They often do depend on so on quote unquote development projects, right? Uh, at the same time, they're hugely concerned about how many of these very same development projects are going to affect the natural world, natural. Uh, you know, polar bear life cycles and things like that, on which the community also depends. So taking sides, I think, is a gross simplification here. And as anthropologists, we've always prided ourselves and challenged ourselves to uh, look at nuance, yeah, uh, to look at, at all sides and to listen to, the, to all beings and all peoples that have a stake in these problems. So, um, yeah, yes and no, I, but... I, I think it's not a, a matter so much of taking sides. It's a, it's a, we are still in the business of translation, I think, of interpretation, of trying to enter the shoes of other people to see what are actual needs and, and what are the voices. Can they be brought into a productive dialogue? And I am, yes, I am hopeful for the future. And I think as anthropologists, we have a unique position to work towards this kind of dialogue. That doesn't mean that things don't have to change. Are you there? I'm sorry, my internet is a little on. Virginia gone away. No, 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 I'm back. Can you not hear me? We can hear you now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my internet is a little unstable. So um, it is now, uh, uh, um, as I said, we usually go long and that's good. It has to do with engagement and, and, and so forth, but uh, let me just, you know, we need to call this quits. We could obviously go on for a long time, but I want to give the, the speakers, uh, I don't know, one last chance. So let's start again in the same order we used before. Paul, you want to say anything that you didn't say? Um, no, just that I agree with Gordon <laughs> in the <laughs> comments. It's predictable. I, I've had this conversation a dozen times, so. It was interesting enough to have it again this time, though, so fair enough. What, what is it you agree with, Gordon? Uh, the, 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 there's basically one perspective that keeps emerging in anthropology for the last five years. And, and just, you, you agree that that is not true? I just, I, I, I think it is true, and I think that I, I also agree, or at least I think I agree with what Alex was just saying, that the, the strength of anthropology is a, a diversity of voices, and having those voices come into a kind of discussion. Um, so you don't have to agree with those voices. Um, but anyway, that's that's my perspective. Nikki, what did you want to um, say anything you hadn't said before or? No, just to thank you um, for the fascinating conversations and engagement and really thought provoking um, questions and responses. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say. Okay, Rui. Oh, well, the, the, uh, well, thank you to all. It was very, very interesting. I don't have a, a, a clear opinion on that as well. As well. I agree with Alex, with Andrea, um, on that uh, position of the anthropologists. Um, it was very, very interesting, your points of view. And perhaps we need to do other webinars just to to expand our, our <laughs> thoughts that emerge here, because there are lots of seeds here that I think they need to 
mature and, and grow and let's debate again on some of the issues. So thank you for this. It was an incredible moment. I'll, I'll pass this on to Clara who organizes, normally, as you know, organizes these webinars. It's fine. Uh, Andrea? Yes, I also would like to thank you and everybody for this very rich debate, very warm and, and hot debate on this topic. And I hope that we can really develop our ideas a little bit farther in another opportunity, because I really think that ethnographic data is, is really important. I, to speak in general like that, uh, ideas at random, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult, at least for me. So I, I feel more comfortable when I am uh, really uh, based on my fieldwork data, the situations, because then we can explore the, the, the context, yeah? the historical context and the immediate context of each uh, situation, yeah, ethnographic situation. But uh, anyway, I think uh, it, this was very provocative and I really bring a lot of uh, questions to my, <laughs> Uh, to my uh, reflections here ab about the issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Alex? Sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be part of this wonderful group. Uh, lots of good ideas. I think I want to close, or my closing note would be, we have a great thing going here for anthropology and within anthropology. Um, but our discipline is also on a daily basis being by available funding, by you know industry. And I think we will have to fight for our position in the world as anthropologists. And I think one of the best ways to do that is by supporting one another. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm all for debate, for hot, sharp and warm debate, as Andrea says, that's wonderful. But ultimately, I think we need to hold each other up through this and in this debate. And I think we see eye to eye on that, uh, Andrea. Um, so <clears throat> we all come from different positions, different positionality, like we said, and we all have strengths. And uh, I, I, I love this forum because it is an example of how we can contribute these strengths, these unique viewpoints um, to make our discipline more heard and more relevant and more applicable in the future. And so I think we need to reach out and seek further dialogue with industry and across disciplines. And I agree also with Andrea that what we have uniquely is ethnographic insight, this very nuanced, detailed, careful way of listening. And so, yes, we have a responsibility, but we also have a responsibility to contribute and make accessible to uh, other disciplines, uh, other industry. And so that's for me the closing note. I hope that we're moving in that direction. And I, I, I am hopeful this discussion again has made me more hopeful that we can find a way together forward and together means not just within anthropology. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alex. Uh, Gordon, I know I, I hadn't asked you, but he is actually deputy chair of the WCAA. And I wonder if, if you wanted to say anything at the end? Just two words, thank you to everybody. It was a really interesting debate and we disagree, but that's what anthropology is all about. And I agree with Alex. Above all, we have to support each other despite our disagreements and I think we can. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Clara, we really? be proud. Thank you. Really? Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, thank you everyone. We should.